The Wounded Knee Massacre. It was one of the worst atrocities against Native Americans ever. Happened in 1890. The U.S. Army rode into South Dakota and slaughtered hundreds of Lakota men, women, and children. Looters ransacked the tribe. They stole many of the Native Americans' most prized possessions. Some stripped right off their bodies. A single stone inscribed with the names of the dead lays at the site where Native Americans were killed and thrown into a massive pit. In the late 1800s, the large bison herds were hunted nearly to extinction, a staple for the Plains Indian survival. Their reservations were being encroached on by settlers and gold miners. Treaties with the U.S. government to protect the reservation from intruders were not being upheld. All of these things led to unrest with the native population on the reservations. During this time, a Paiute prophet named Wakova had a vision that Jesus Christ had returned in the form of a Native American. According to Wakova, the white invaders would disappear from the native lands. The ancestors would lead them to good hunting grounds. The buffalo herds and all the other animals would return and the ghosts of the ancestors would return to the earth. He founded the ghost dance religion based on these principles. After this, they would live in peace on their lands. All of this would be brought on by the performance of a ghost dance performed as a shuffle in silence to a slow, single drumbeat. The Lakota ambassador for Wakova were kicking bear and short bull. They taught Lakota the performing of the ghost dance. They would wear a special ghost dance shirt that Black Elk had seen in a vision. Kicking Bear believed that the shirt had the power to repel bullets. Some of the other tribes, including the Sioux, believed that an earthquake and flood would occur and drown all the white men. The ghost dance religion spread as a result of destruction of the Native American way of life. The entire livelihood of the Plains tribes were involved entirely around the bison. Without the resources from the bison, their cultures lost the ability to thrive and forced the Native American tribes to rely on the United States government to provide rations and goods, or else they would face starvation, their way of life rapidly fading, and the ghost dance religion brought hope to the people that the white man would soon disappear. The buffalo herds would return, and the people would be reunited with their ancestors, the old ways before the white man would return once again. It was a religious movement in response to the destruction of their culture. The sight of the ghost dance to the settlers was alarming. They were worried it might be a sign of a potential attack. One of the settlers that was worried was a U.S. Indian agent at the Standing Rock Agency, the same agency where Chief Sitting Bull lived. U.S. officials decided to take some chiefs into custody in order to quell what they called the Messiah craze. The U.S. military first hoped to convince Buffalo Bill, who was a friend of Sitting Bull, to aid in the plan to reduce the chance of violence. James McLaughlin, who was a Standing Rock agent, overrode the military and immediately sent the Indian police in to arrest Sitting Bull on December 15, 1890. He sent 40 Native American policemen to arrest Sitting Bull at his home. Sitting Bull refused to comply, and the policemen used force, which enraged the Lakota that were in the village. Catch the Bear, who was a Lakota villager, grabbed his rifle and shot Lieutenant Bullhead, who reacted by firing his revolver into the chest of Sitting Bull. Red Tomahawk, another police officer, shot Sitting Bull in the head. He dropped to the ground and died between 12 and 1 p.m. After his death, 200 members of the band fled Standing Rock Agency and joined Spotted Elk later known as Bigfoot at the Cheyenne River Indian Reservation. So Spotted Elk with his band along with 38 of Sitting Bull's band left December 23rd and headed towards Pine Ridge Indian Reservation to shelter with Red Cloud's band. General Leonard Wright Colby wrote a letter to a former Indian agent, Valentine McGillicuddy, January 15, 1891. He asked him his opinion on the hostilities surrounding the ghost dance movement. The letter reads as follows. As for the ghost dance, too much attention has been paid to it. It was only the symptom or surface indication of a deep-rooted, long-existing difficulty. As well, treat the eruption of smallpox as a disease and ignore the constitutional disease. As regards disarming the Sioux, however desirable it may appear, I consider it neither advisable nor practical. I fear it will result in the theoretical enforcement of prohibition in Kansas, Iowa, and Dakota. 
You will succeed in disarming and keeping disarmed the friendly Indians because you can, and you will not succeed with the mob element because you cannot. If I were again to be an Indian agent and had my choice, I would take charge 10,000 armed Sioux in preference to a like number of disarmed ones, and furthermore agree to handle that number or the whole Sioux nation without a white soldier, respectively V.T. McGillicuddy. P.S. I neglected to state that up to date there has been neither a Sioux outbreak or war. No citizen in Nebraska or Dakota has been killed, molested, or can show a scratch of a pin, and no property has been destroyed off the reservation. General Miles sent this telegram from Rapid City to General John Schofield in Washington, D.C., December 19, 1890. The difficult Indian problem cannot be solved permanently at the end of the line. It requires the fulfillment of Congress of the treaty obligations that the Indians were entreated and coursed into signing. They signed away the valuable portion of their reservation, and it is now occupied by white people, for which they have received nothing. They understood that ample provisions would be made for their support, Instead, their supplies have been reduced, and much of the time, they have been living on half and two-thirds of rations. Their crops as well, as the crops of the white people for two years, has been almost total failures. The dissatisfaction is widespread, especially among the Sioux. While the Cheyennes have been on the verge of starvation, and were forced to commit desperations to sustain life. These facts are beyond question, and the evidence is positive and sustained by thousands of witnesses. Spotted Elk was on his way to Pine Ridge Agency with 350 of his followers. They were still making the slow journey on December 28, 1890, when they were met by a 7th Cavalry Detachment under Major Samuel M. Whitside, southwest of Porcupine Butte, John Shangru, a scout for the 7th Cavalry and interpreter, who himself was half Lakota, advised the troops not to disarm the Indians immediately and that it would lead to violence. So the troops escorted the Native Americans about five miles west to Wounded Knee Creek and they ordered them to make camp. That night, Colonel James Forsyth and the rest of the 7th Cavalry arrived, bringing the total number of troops to 500 compared to the 350 Native Americans. December 29, 1890. At sunrise, Colonel Forsyth ordered the Native Americans to surrender their weapons and that they immediately be removed from the zone of military operations and wait for trains. The U.S. troops searched the camp and found about 38 rifles. Even more rifles were found when the soldiers searched the Native Americans themselves. None of the elderly Native Americans were armed. It is said that a Native American medicine man, whose name was Yellowbird, was egging on the younger Native Americans who were agitated by the search, and tensions were high. The soldiers began to feel threatened. Specific details of what happened next are debated. There are many different accounts of what happened from the Native Americans and soldiers alike. According to some, Yellowbird, the medicine man, began performing the ghost dance and told the other Lakota there that ghost shirts were bulletproof. As this was going on, a Native American named Black Coyote refused to give up his rifle. It is said that he was deaf, spoke no English, and did not understand the order. One Native American told the soldier, Black Coyote is deaf. The soldier persisted, trying to take the rifle. The same Native American yelled, Stop! He cannot hear your orders! At that moment, two soldiers grabbed Black Coyote from behind. Allegedly, during this struggle, Black Coyote's rifle discharged. The moment the rifle went off, Yellowbird threw a hand of dust into the air, and five young Native American warriors that had rifles hidden threw their blankets aside and fired their rifles at Troop K of the 7th Cavalry. The dust thrown into the air was a sign to attack. After the initial rifle fire from the natives, the soldiers turned around and fired indiscriminately upon the Native Americans. I will now go over some of the eyewitness accounts of the massacre from a journalist with the 7th Cavalry, Thomas Tiblitz. Suddenly, I heard a single shot from the direction of the troops, then three or four, a few more, and immediately a volley. At once came a general rattle of rifle firing, then the Hotchkiss guns. Lakota survivor Dewey Beard. Then many Indians broke into the ravine. Some ran up the ravine to favorable positions for defense. 
Lakota survivor, black elk, medicine man. I did not know then how much was ended. When I look back now from this high hill of my old age, I can still see a butchered woman and children lying in heaps and scattered along the crooked gulch, as plain as when I saw them with my eyes when they were still young. As I can see that something else died there in the bloody mud and was buried in the blizzard. A people's dream died there. It was a beautiful dream. And to whom so great a vision was given in my youth. You see me now, a pitiful old man who has done nothing. The nation's hope is broken and scattered. There is no center any longer, and the sacred tree is dead. Chief American Horse. There was a woman with an infant in her arms who was killed as she almost touched the flag of truce. After almost all had been killed, a cry was made at those who were not killed or wounded shall come forth and they would be safe. Little boys came out of their places of refuge, and as soon as they came in sight, a number of soldiers surrounded them and butchered them there. Captain Edward Godfrey, Company D of the 7th Cavalry, who was a lieutenant in Captain Banteen's force during the Battle of Little Bighorn, he writes, I know the men did not aim deliberately, and they were greatly excited. I don't believe they saw their sights. They fired rapidly, but it seems to me only a few seconds till there was not a living thing before us. Warriors, children, squalls, ponies, and dogs went down before that unnamed fire. Hugh McGinnis, 1st Battalion, K Company, 7th Cavalry, writes, General Nelson Miles, who visited the scene of carnage following the three-day blizzard, estimated that around 300 snow-shrouded forms were strewn over the countryside. He also discovered, to his horror, the helpless children and women with babies in their arms that had been chased as far as two miles from the original scene and cut down without mercy by the troops. Judging by the slaughter on the battlefield, it was suggested that a soldier simply went berserk. For who could explain such a merciless disregard for life? As I see, it was the battle more or less a matter of spontaneous combustion, sparked by mutual distrust. Father Francis M.J. Kraft, Catholic Missionary The whole trouble originated through interested whites who had gone about almost industriously and misrepresented the army and its movements upon all the agencies. The Indians were in consequence alarmed and suspicious. They had been led to believe that the true aim of the military was their extermination. The troops acted with the greatest kindliness and prudence. In the wounded knee fight, the Indians fired first. The troops fired only when compelled to. I was between both, saw all, and knew from an absolute knowledge of the whole affair whereof I say. General Nelson A. Miles writes, A scuffle occurred between one deaf warrior who had a rifle in his hand and two soldiers. The rifle was discharged and a battle occurred. Not only the warriors, but the sick chief Spotted Elk, and a large number of women and children who tried to escape by running and scattering over the prairie were hunted down and killed. Modern historians have found information that supports the fact that Block Coyote was deaf and that he owned a Winchester rifle. At first, all the firing was at close range towards the Native Americans. Half of them were killed or wounded before any of them had a chance to get off any shots. A number of Native Americans grabbed rifles that had not yet been confiscated or ran to the pile of confiscated weapons on the ground. They opened fire on the soldiers. With this lasted just a few moments at most. While the Native Americans and the soldiers were fighting at close range, other soldiers with Hotchkiss guns fired at the teepee camp from a hill. It was full of women and children. And it is also believed that many of the U.S. soldiers were victims of fratricide, known as friendly fire from the Hotchkiss guns, shot down by their fellow soldiers. The remaining Native American women and children fled the camp and headed for a ravine to avoid the crossfire. The officers had lost all control of their men. Some soldiers fanned out to finish off the wounded. Others jumped onto their horses and pursued the native men, women, and children. Some of the soldiers chased them down for miles across the prairie. In less than an hour, 150 Lakota were killed and 50 wounded. Some estimates that nearly 300 of the original 350 had been killed or wounded. After the massacre, a blizzard had struck preventing an immediate search of the massacre site. After the massacre reports indicate that 51 survivors, 4 men and 47 women and children were put onto wagons. They were taken to Pine Ridge Reservation. 
Army casualties consisted of 25 dead and 39 wounded. Black Coyote, who fired the first shot of the massacre, whether it was an accident or not, he died at Wounded Knee. The blizzard continued for three days, covering the massacre site in snow. The U.S. military hired civilians to bury the Lakota dead. When the civilian party arrived, they found all deceased frozen to the ground. They were all gathered and placed into a large mass grave on a hill overlooking the TP campsite, the same hill where the Hotchkiss guns were located during the massacre, buried in the same place where the cannon fire originated that killed so many men, women, and children. It was reported that they had found four infants alive, still wrapped in their mother's shawls. Reports state that 84 men, 44 women, and 18 children were killed on the field. Seven more Lakota were mortally wounded. General Miles denounced Forsyth and relieved him of his command. An army court of inquiry convened by General Miles had criticized Forsyth, but otherwise exonerated him of responsibility for the massacre. The court of inquiry was not conducted as a formal court-martial. The Secretary of War made a final decision and reinstated Forsyth to command the 7th Cavalry. Testimony indicated that troops attempted to avoid non-combatant casualties. Even after this, General Miles continued to criticize him. He believed he had deliberately disobeyed his commands in order to destroy the Lakota. Miles stated that Wounded Knee was a deliberate massacre rather than a tragedy caused by poor decisions. He tried to destroy Forsyth's career, but this failed and Forsyth was later promoted to Major General. Many non-Lakota living in the reservation interpreted the massacre as a defeat of a murderous cult. Other people confused the ghost dancers with Native Americans in general. A article was written by the young L. Frank Baum, the author of The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, which he would write later in his life. He wrote this in response to the massacre. January 3rd, 1891. The pioneer has been declared, for our only safety depends upon the total extermination of the Indians. Having wronged them for centuries, we had better, in order to protect our civilization, follow it up by one more wrong, and wipe these untamed and untamable creatures from the face of the earth. In this lies future safety for our settlers and soldiers who are under incompetent commands. Otherwise, we may expect future years to be as full of trouble with the Redskins as those have been in the past. This was not the opinion of everyone during the time, but hearing his opinion so boldly stated is shocking. So much hate written out on paper for the whole world to read. This was commonplace during the time, but to hear this hate from an author of a children's book so many grew up to love makes it hard to understand how much hate could fall upon a group of people. This was their land after all and they were here first. From the moment Christopher Columbus landed in the New World, the Native Americans were persecuted. All they wanted was to live their lives in peace and not be persecuted. But it did not end that way. My heart goes out to the Native Americans that died that day. Soon after the massacre, some of the survivors banded together and formed the Wounded Knee Survivors Association. They sought compensation from the United States government for the many deaths and injuries. Another part of the story is the stranded 9th Cavalry. The 9th Cavalry was scouting near the White River, 15 miles north of the Indian Agency at Pine Ridge, when the massacre occurred. They rode south all night to reach the reservation the morning of December 30th. Troops F, I, and K arrived safely, but the wagons, a distance behind guarded by Troop D, were attacked by 50 Lakota warriors near Cheyenne Creek, about two miles from the agency. One soldier was immediately killed. The wagon train tried to protect itself by circling the wagons. Corporal William Wilson volunteered to ride out with a message to the agency to summon help after the scouts refused to go. He sped off through the wagon circle his fellow troops covering him while the Lakota were in pursuit. He made it to the agency. The 9th Cavalry came to the rescue and the Lakota retreated. Corporal Wilson received the Medal of Honor for his actions that day. The 9th Cavalry were stationed at Pine Ridge Reservation for the rest of the winter until March. They were the only regiment left on the reservation. The Army awarded 31 Medals of Honor for the 1890 campaign. 19 for services at Wounded Knee. Native American activists had urged that the medals be withdrawn. Wounded Knee was declared a U.S. National Historic Landmark in 1965. 
It was listed on the U.S. National Register of Historic Places in 1966. And that is the massacre at Wounded Knee. A difficult part in our history, to say the least. There have been many, many massacres since the United States was formed. Many involving the U.S. military and Native Americans. Massacres on both ends, you know. But uh, usually when... Uh, uh, U.S. does it. It's a battle. When the Indians do it, it's a massacre. But this one is definitely a massacre. They killed so many men, women, and children. And there wasn't that many rifles on the Native Americans to begin with. I think total there was like 40-something rifles the Native Americans had with 350 of them. And most of them were women and children. There was a lot of women and children there. And there was some survivors from this. Majority of them died. A very brutal death. And the fact that they used that Hotchkiss gun that was just up on the hill. Firing down into the village. Just actually killing some of their own people too. They uh, definitely committed some fratricide. Killing everybody and it just shows that command in the military is very very important to control your men there was like little kids with women and children running away and soldiers were running them down on horses and just brutally murdering everybody yeah thank you very much folks i hope you enjoyed this one as much as you could it was a sad one a depressing one but a part in our history that needed to be told and needed to be remembered so we don't make the same mistakes again. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the next. Peace.